stems and we just cut about an inch above, an inch below um, each one of the each one of the nodes, and just simply insert it into the potting soil. Um, after about three weeks, then those plants will have a nice root ball. We'll pull them out and we'll put them in our six-inch pots from the greenhouse and let them grow up to four or five feet tall. We'll stake them up and tape them up so they're um, nice and tall, and so the flowers are hanging down right in for crossing. Um, so we've got these mister systems in here. Before we had the mister systems, people would just be in here watering, and invariably the water too heavy, too light, so we did have a lot of failures. But with these, we can set each bench um, based on the controls over there for our frequency of water, amount of water. So if it's a week old cutting, it'll take a different amount of water than a three week old cutting. So we've had a lot of success this way. Um, and, you know, this way, um, for our breeding program, we have identified these plants in the nurseries. And we want to use them in our Iowa station for their crossing program. We want to use them in our Idaho station for their crossing program. We can go out and take those stems, put them on ice overnight them, and they can take those cuttings the same way we do here in their growth rooms, um, and then put them in their greenhouse. And so we can use one elite plant in a bunch of different breeding programs. If it's after the third winter, um, obviously the plant stays in the field. We can go after the fourth winter and look at the plant again. If it doesn't look very good, we can go back and take all the project seed out of our breeding program. So it's, it's a great way to basically bulk up these elite plants in the field without going out and digging the plants out and having one shot um, at one plant. So, um, and when we look at the breeding nurseries outside, they'll show you how it, um, the, the nurseries are on a grid system, so it's a range row plant, so anybody can go out and find range two, row ten, plant three, so that um, every plant is you know, specifically identified in the field, so we can take those um, notes, every cutting, and go out and take those cut those stems to take cutting. So um, so after every cutting of every year we'll take notes for leaf diseases, for um, persistence, for vigor, and that's how we identify those elite plants after three or four winters. So questions? Six millimeter grind. Then we have to run it through a, a one millimeter grind that grinds it down to a powder. <laughs> we have to grind it down to this um, consistency. That's what our NAR machines are, are set up to, to analyze. And then through, even through the fine grinder, there's some stratification. You can kind of see it's a little bit, I've been shaking a little bit, but it's a little bit lighter green in the bottom, dark green in the top. So we've got an old dryer out here that we put them in and we tumble them to make sure we've got a homogeneous sample that we're analyzing. So. So all the elite nursery plants we run through this process in all of our four yield trials. Um, if it's a demo trial, we just have two thirds of the entries are varieties. We'll, the first production year, first and second cut, we'll take quality on all the plots. We we'll take about a foot and a half foot um, section out of the middle of the plot. If it's an experimental trial, we'll take the check varieties and the experimental lines. So the first production year, first and second cut again, so that if those experimentals go to market, we've got quality data on all of those. So um, again, the variety of trials. Of marketing if cropland wants their newest varieties, the quality on those compared to some of the competitor companies, then we've got all that data on hand. So we typically run 10 to 12,000 samples a year from California to New York. So everything is run here on our NAR machine. We've got a Davis, California station that they're going to be set up to run NAR next year. So they'll have most of the California samples. So um, that number is going to increase this year moving forward with the reduced lignin project. Obviously that quality is a big component of that, so we're probably going to run closer to 20,000 samples this year. Come on down, I'll show you the NR machine we analyze the samples. Code on it, and it's got a label. This one is 2011 Shafter RRL Nursery, so it's from our Davis, California station. Um, Shafter is, one, like Dave said, one of the satellite um, locations that they test. Um, RRL is a reduced lignin nursery. It's got the range, row, and plant number, and it's got the um, pedigree, the plant ID, and all that information is in this barcode, including what cut it is, um, or whatever other information that's that's pertinent to the sample. So to run that air, we just pour the sample into the sample cup. It's got um, quartz glass in the bottom of the cup that it reads from, from underneath. Shut the lid, hit that to run the sample, and then we just scan the barcode. <coughs> The sample takes about 40 seconds to run. Um, 
So all of our samples at the end of the year, we send our spectra, part of the NARS consortium, we send them all of our spectra, all of our results, they look at it, they find outliers for different components, whether it's protein or fiber, um, and then we can find, they pick out 30, 35 samples that they want to include in the equation, so we go find the, those samples in our hallway, send them those physical samples, um, they run wet chemistry on that, they add that chemistry to these equations and send us the equation updates, so our, these equations are more robust, more accurate every year. Um, we're obviously not able to run 12 to 20,000 samples through wet chemistry every year, so this is um, a way that we can take samples on cut one if it's a 400 plant nursery. Uh, we can get the results from it between first and second cut, sort them out, look at, and based on that sort, um, we can take 250 samples next time. Um, so it's a way to really save money and resources in our, in our breeding program in the nursery, in the nurseries, and then obviously for trials, we're looking at product um, differences. So, so then we, we can look at the results from that sample. Um, ADF, that's fiber, and then ash, crude protein, ADL is lignin, um, NDF, and then NDFD, that digestibility. RFQ, that's uh, calculation is not correct. I just plug these numbers into another spreadsheet and get the correct RFQ um, numbers from Dan Undersaner's got a uh, spreadsheet actually that we use for that. Um, so, you know, this protein is 25. Uh, it's a little bit high. Well, when we take our samples, we don't lose a single leaf in the field, obviously. We put the sample in the flat and we grind it down. So um, they might be a little bit higher than you would see in a field, um, but it's still all relative, you know, because obviously in the field you're going to lose some leaves, so the quality's not going to be quite as high as it would be um, by, by doing the process we run. But still everything's relative, so they should all sort out the same. Any questions? I put a, a bag over the back and pick them up to the light. Um, so with the leaf pot for experimentals, um, so when we cross in the greenhouse in the winter, February we harvest the seed. If it's a leaf hopper and resistant line, I'll seed in 12 rows, and usually in the middle row I'll put a susceptible line. Um, and when the plants get about two inches tall, I'll open up the cage, um, suck about 100 leaf hoppers off here, and I take my hand and shake the leaves, and they'll be three times as many leaf hoppers on the screen. Suck about 100 off of here, and pull the cork out, dump them in there. Um, seven to 10 days later, on the plants that are susceptible to yeah. leaf hopper feeding, they'll have tipped over tops, the leaves will be starting to turn yellow and they'll be shorter in your nose. The ones that are um, resistant, they'll look like normal, healthy, um, healthy plants. So it's a quick, clean, easy screen. Um, and then we'll just pull the parents off. The plants that look good, pop them up in our six inch you know, pots. If they're going to stay here for crossing, if they're going to go out to Idaho for seed increase, and we'll pop them up into peat pots and ship them out there. Um, obviously, these aren't alfalfa plants. I use lima beans, they grow quicker, there's more biomass, so the leaf hoppers are produce a lot quicker around there. And we'll look at, we've got a leaf hopper demo in the field, we don't have um, a lot of pressure this year, and probably six or seven years out of ten we get um, enough pressure for economic threshold, but our Iowa station, our Pennsylvania station, nine or ten years out of ten they get you know, you know, heavy infestations, so we do most of our field screening and field evaluation for leaf hoppers at those locations. No questions, I'll pass you off to Michelle and she'll talk about our crossing program in the winter here in the green houses. We do here in the winter and it's a polycross and an, F, um, and an F1 cross. The polycross is a cross where we take like a group of plants with the same characteristics and, and um, pollinate them together. And um, to do that, we use um, sandpaper, it's 320 emery paper and we make little boats out of it. And we just go through and collect a bunch of pollen on our boat and then go through and we have our plants lined up and then trip three plants and then we just keep but, um, switching off the pollen just to make sure it's equally distributed, okay? Um, the F1 cross that we do is a little bit more tedious. Um, so what we do is we take a plant that and we go through and we pick out one of the nicest flowers and then any of the flowers that have um, that have any dead flowers on it or that have not opened yet, the florets that have not opened yet, we go ahead and we pull those off because we want to make sure that we have just that one um, set of pollen in there. Another thing that we do do is we sanitize our sterilize our tools with 70% alcohol to make sure that we do not get any cross-contamination, okay? So 
what we do is we take our flower that we picked and each flower cross that we do is tagged with an individual cross number and we cut off the back petal. So in each of these little things are called a floret and they produce three to five seeds per floret. So then we take our forceps and then we trip the anther out. Yeah. And you want to make sure they're all tripped and then we just shake the pollen off that's currently on there. And then we take pollen from the plant that is designated to have and we collect pollen on our boat. And any time that you switch your plant, you have to use a new bowl so you do not cross-contaminate. So yeah, it's a tedious job. Very, very <laughs> tedious. Had to have good eye-hand coordination and be able to really pay attention to the detail, which Rochelle's been doing for many years, <laughs> and she's gotten really good at it. But it's a hard thing to do. You want to make sure you want to make sure you rub all of the all the anthers. Make sure you get enough adequate pollen on them. And I usually go through and do that once, and then I'll collect a little bit more pollen from my plant, and then do it a second time, just in case I missed anything. So, um, like I said, you get three to five seeds per floret, and if I were to do, I do. Huh? That's the carpet. Yeah. So oh, I, yeah. if I do if I do 12 to 15 florets per raceme, and I do 10 of those, that will give me one gram of seed, which is about 350 seeds. Okay. There's 450 grams to a pound. Yeah. And so you can picture how much a pound you need to seed, you know. So you need more than one cross on the plant then. Yes. Yeah. Um, you like you can process. see, here's a picture of like in the winter time. There's times where our plants are just loaded with yeah. crosses. They look like little Christmas trees almost. Yeah. So each bud will have a different cross. It could. It could have the same one. It just depends on how much seed you need to produce for that specific cross. Yeah. Um, so you can see the process here going through cross pollinating. And then here's, you know, obviously our plants with all this, the tape on them. When, when, after they get crossed, this is a few days after it's crossed. They kind of close up. If you can see on here, they kind of yeah. close up like this. Mm -hmm. They get kind of like shrivel up, and then they you, start to emerge. You almost think like, oh, are they gonna die? And sometimes you have abortion. I think the, the florets will abort, and you won't get any seed set. There's a lot of different factors. Sometimes you don't have enough pollen on there at all. Sometimes like there could be a spray, or if they got hit by like a a whole, like a lot of wind or something right after being crossed on, we try to um, minimize that kind of thing so that you will have really good seed set. Yeah. But that's kind of how they look. Um, so to day 10, you'll have really, you should have really nice curls and they'll be nice and green. And then after five to six weeks, then they'll turn brown and that's when they're ready to, to be harvested. Um, in the summertime, generally you get five weeks and you can have your seed ready. Just because it's warmer and sunnier, in the wintertime is generally six weeks. And then we put it in our sieve, and we, this is how we thrash our seed. So, you know, like this particular plant, say I have to put ten crosses. You know, on this plant they're all the same cross. I can put all those in here, and then I go through and I thrash them. And then the seed all goes to the bottom of the pan. And then you just have to blow out the, the garbage on there, and then you get nice clean seed after the fact. So, um, you want to talk about the... Yeah, like we said, so so to create a gram of seed, you'd need 350 seeds. To create a pound of seed, you'd need 450 grams. So we obviously can't do, we can't create pounds of seed here in our greenhouses. We have a lot of people who do this day in and day out from, usually from about October to March. Um, sometimes a little bit earlier, but it can go on until January, February, March, sometimes, some years. Um, so we have a lot of crossing going on here. We also have other research stations that have greenhouses that will also do similar crossing. But I believe ours is the biggest greenhouses for, for FGI, for research. Um, 
But say you get to um, you know something that you really want to ramp up seed production on, you would create breeder seed, and that's where we would send the seed. We'd send plants as cuttings out to Idaho, and that's where we have another research facility. And it's it's hotter, it's drier, it's more conducive to seed production for alfalfa, and so they'll actually produce the seed a lot of times under cage seed production. So it's under like these screened in kind of rooms almost um, and then they'll put bees on there and so they'll use different types of bees sometimes alkali bees or leaf cutter bees um, depends on the area where they're at and what they what they like to use in that area so they'll use bees to produce seed and usually breeder seed is about two to four pounds of seed um, for that increase from there we'll do you know more breeding more seed increases um, and usually go up to foundation seed which would be more like 500 to 1,000 pounds of seed. That would be done more on like contracting with a grower who would produce it under multiple acres of seed. And at that point, it, it would uh, it wouldn't be under cage seed production. It would be in, in field. So we'll just be on the and I think I have to wrap up. So, um, but um, as you can see, it's it's a lot of work. We put a lot of care into making sure that we're, we're producing the best seed that we can do. And I think you guys are heading out the store. And if you have any questions. So all these uh, progeny rows are 27 space plants uh, long. And what that gives us the ability to do is see which are the best families or crosses and evaluate them here in the field for agronomic characteristics, as well as we can do within family selection. So you can see there's a lot of uh, uh, differences between individual plants or progeny within a family. And, and some of the things we're looking for, you can see between the two, blue flags, this is a family that's better adapted to this uh, West Salem environment compared to a family that's between the two, two uh, orange flags. So this nursery was planted in 2012 and we leave the nurseries in for a period of four years. Why do we do that? Because persistence or yield over time is a very important trait. We don't want the plants that look best the first year or we just don't want the groups of plants that look best in the last year. But uh, when we plant these, we usually use the first year for establishment. And then after that, every cutting, four cuttings a year, we're out here looking and evaluating every plant in these nurseries and evaluating for vigor, making notes on, on disease. One of the things that we're big on, some of the traits, is multiple pest resistance. So. We need a, a disease package and an insect package in our varieties that go out to hay producers. So these are inoculated with a cocktail of approximately six common alfalfa diseases in the greenhouse before they're brought to the field and planted, so they're already inoculated. And then at this location, we let the winter work on the plants and see if they get taken out due to disease, uh, other biotic stresses like disease or insects, or uh, this is one nursery of many that we have in our breeding program. We probably have close to two dozen nurseries like this on this farm, as well as we uh, have different locations across the U.S. In the dormant breeding program, which is housed here in West Salem, we also have nurseries that could be just like this or a little bit different in Iowa and over in Pennsylvania. So we're, we're, we're getting location. We want to have broad geographic adaptation in our varieties. So let's say it's the end of four years and we identify a group of plants. There's 4,000 plants in this nursery, but we're only interested in the 50 to 100 best. What we'll do is take uh, larger, bigger plants from, from adapted families and we might start out with a group of two to 400 plants and then do quality on them. We're not only yield, uh, interested in, in yield or persistence, but we need to make sure they have good good uh, quality or, or relative feed quality. So we'll do the NIR, you saw that component. We'll harvest an individual plant, grind it, run it through the NIR lab. So we'll get more information on quality. Um, if it's a native trait, what I've been talking about, insect and disease, we'll have that information. Or if we have a genetically engineered trait, we might need to know what genes are in this and how many genes. Alfalfa is a tetraploid. So um, we'll want to know whether it's got one, one insert of that gene, two inserts, three inserts, can have up to four inserts 
in that plant. So <clears throat> let's say we've identified this is our desirable plant. We can just take a stem cutting and we can use that to start a plant and they go back to the greenhouse. These two plants would be genetically identical. Um, then we can cross it with other elite plants. What we're doing is taking the best and crossing them with the best. That seeds produced in the greenhouse can then go to two places. It either could come back to a nursery like this, or we could send it to Idaho for a seed increase. If we send it to Idaho, what we've done is uh, we would interpollinate that select group, let's say 50 plants, crossing the best with the best, and that would make what we would term an experimental variety. And that would go into a yield trial that we'll see later on the tour, and it will, will generate hundreds of experimental varieties each year, and we'll leave them at different locations in their particular target area, and we'll evaluate forage yield and forage quality. And out of that hundreds, we'll narrow it down to five or 10 after four years of testing that these are beating the standard checks. They're better than the varieties on the market for specific metrics, and they merit release as a variety. Then the seeds produced in, in Idaho, and it's uh, distributed within our network and, and sold to growers. Um, so that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. Are there any questions? No questions? Well, let me, let me make another point. Um, when we make those crosses in, in Idaho, one of the other things we do is we plant a general combining ability test, and you'll see that. When we select just based on the phenotype here in the field, we deem that phenotypic or current selection. Or if we plant it in a progeny test, like you'll see uh, three ranges down there, we can get a better estimate of yield. Um, by, by measuring the progeny, what we're doing is measuring how well the genetics or uh, the genes that are transferred to the seed, how well do those perform? With traits with low heritability, such as yield, that's, that's very key in, in making our varieties better, better yielding. Um, if no questions, we'll continue on the tour. We have quite a few stops to make this morning. So uh, we can load up on the wagons. <laughs> we have our uh, all new computer system. Uh, direct seeded, no weed control. And that looks different from year to year depending on what kind of weeds you have in here. Sometimes it's solid pigweed that are four or five feet tall. Other years, you know, it looks like this. We have some nice lamb quarter in there and velvet leaf. Uh, but, you know, so, so I think one of the things to think about on this is you don't always get a, a yield reduction when, by not controlling weeds. It's just that most of your yield is just, is just weeds. So you gotta be careful on, on, on taking yield off of these plots because that one's probably gonna be the highest yielding one. It's probably gonna be your least desirable. But, but quite a bit of difference in, in how the plots are managed in, in what you're gonna get in, in return. Randy, do you wanna say anything? So, so uh, at our answer plots, maybe uh, some of you have seen our demos, at our answer plots are really kind of a, a outgrowth of, of this demonstration that, that Dave actually started uh, a number of years ago where we're doing these different comparisons using the Rounder Birdie technology. And so I think in the Wisconsin uh, Upper Midwest uh, establishment systems, one of the things we really want to have you think about is changing the way that we establish alfalfa. And so the demonstrations here were in Wisconsin, we use oats historically as a cover crop, and we oat, let oats get too mature. What we're trying to show you here is the destructive nature of oats as, it is, uh, as the alfalfa and the uh, oats try to establish together, they become very competitive. And you have to make a choice as a producer and as a seller, uh, with working with producers, you know, how do you want to establish your alfalfa? And we obviously want to move away from this oats to grain uh, discussion piece. And, and Dave's already mentioned this. If you're on a highly erosive soil, we need to have probably oats as a cover crop to keep the soil on the hillside to a point. And that means that when that oats gets up about a foot tall, or shorter, we have an option now with the Roundup Ready system to actually spray that uh, spray that oats off, right, and kill it. The other option, if you, if you do go to the foliage system, uh, oats clipped, this system is becoming very popular, where we actually take the oats and clip them for oatlage and then spray the stubble. So these are new ways, new technologies. As I like to say, it's no different than using a you know a cell phone for the you know smartphones. It's no different than using GPS. 
all these technologies that come about, you have to kind of learn how to use them. And so this to me is becoming, in Wisconsin, is becoming a huge uh, uh, advantage how we establish alfalfa. Avoid this oats to grain thing. Take the oats off early. Either spray them out when they're short, or we let the, the uh, crop go to oatage. Take it through your heifers, dry cows, beef cows, and then we spray the stubble uh, with the Roundup Ready alfalfa system. So some, some new technologies that are coming about to help us establish alfalfa. What do you like to see for bushels or pounds of oats? So seeding rate, way? great question, Todd. Uh, what we want to do is probably reduce that seeding rate a little bit. If you can get that seeding rate down uh, to maybe a, a bushel and a half, you do not need three bushel of oats, okay? Bushel and a half, bushel and a quarter, but certainly less than, than two bushel of oats. It uh, gives us good cover, so the best of both worlds. You get the cover, get them sprayed out, get the alfalfa established. The goal is, is to let that alfalfa come up through that dead and dying oat and give you good ground, con uh, good ground cover with uh, no soil erosion is the goal. So bushel, bushel and a half is probably fine, okay? How many people had replants this year on alfalfa? You guys all had them in the past? Usually the same people. If you think about uh, the way they actually uh, plant their alfalfa, whether it's drill or etc., uh, whether they use a cover crop or not, I kind of been keeping track of uh, replants. And Steve's historically the same people that are doing the same method that ain't changing. So I think it's our jobs to uh, look at that uh, grower's place and maybe recommend some of this stuff that we're seeing here. So the other piece about Roundup Ready alfalfa that I think is really important, and it comes back to this reseeding piece that Todd's talking about, is that if you do uh, have to go back in and do a reseed, and you've got basically the reseeded alfalfa and established alfalfa in the same field, the Roundup system is wonderful because you don't have the injury risks that we have with using the Pursuit, Raptor, Buck Trails, all that other stuff that you've used in the past. Right? I probably economically you wouldn't have, wouldn't have had to on other plots, uh, but they'll talk about the management at, at another stop. just want to look at, at these uh, un, unsprayed plots. Uh, most of these are experimental lines, but in here you will see uh, a Roundup Ready glandular here variety and then a conventional one, which is a, the Hyperforce 2400. And this is a, another commercial potato leaf hopper resistant variety from, from Pioneer. So just looking at the agronomics of, of the newer genetics and the potato leaf hopper material that has a glandular hair trait giving it resistance to potato leaf hoppers, uh, the agronomics have improved a lot in the last few years and uh, you know, uh, Cropland has been real aggressive in, in up, updating their genetics and, um, frequently making sure they have the best products on the market. Uh, I think the key here is, you know, and we haven't had a lot of potato leaf hoppers here. You can still see the differences, even under uh, low leaf hopper pressure. You can see you can see the yield advantage. And in some of these products, like the Hybrid Force, is sold based on the yield advantage, and it's not all yielding the glandular haired material that's that's in here. So really gives some people some some opportunities if you're in an area where people aren't spraying or they're they're planting under a cover crop for oats and, and you know they're not scouting in there or spraying, gives them an advantage of trying to get an established stand. Uh, it works well for people that are, uh, you know, not necessarily the Roundup Ready glandular haired line, but the glandular haired lines that are conventional that don't have the Roundup Ready trait. It, it gives the organic producers something they can use and not have to worry about applying insecticides. So, place where I use the moose a lot on a lot of accounts is on these large dairies that uh, might have a couple fields that are way away from their buildings or way away from their other uh, alfalfa fields that they really don't want to take their sprayer over and spray it. This is where we use it. Also used in a lot of situations in some of those uh, small, hard to get to fields. Uh, that's where we use a lot of this product. Now as you, as you get farther north geographically, it's the, uh, the glandular hair trade is not as important having potato leaf hopper resistance. Uh, you know, they'll have less pressure in a year-in, year-out basis. Probably we have economic thresholds here, maybe three out of five years. Lately, we've had a, uh, like last year was pretty dry in the summer, so we had a little higher pressure, but it's probably been maybe one out of the last four have really had a lot of potato leaf hopper pressure, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. So, so we're spraying a little re more regularly here, but, but if you're a producer, you know, there's only one, probably one in the last four years where we had to spray a lot. So you're better off in areas, you know, here and going north with 
your most elite genetics and spraying when you need to. As you go as you go south, more important to have glandular hair res, uh, material that has potato leaf hopper resistance. And also as you go east, so if you so we're on station here, we don't do a lot of potato leaf hopper selection because we don't get a, a ton of pressure. Uh, so we do most of our selections in Iowa, Central Iowa, and in Pennsylvania. Pretty much every year they're going to have potato leaf hoppers, and, and at some point during the year we'll get good selections on our space plant nurseries there. And then we just test the germplasm here, but we're not doing selections on station here. Be careful not to make the statement that they will never have to spray. So if we have a year where there's abundance, overwhelming, it's kind of like rootworm pressure. Uh, if you got a little bit, it takes care of it. If you got a lot, it's not going to. So never make that statement that they'll never have to spray with this uh, uh, technology because if there's abundance, they'll still probably have to spray. All right. So, so alfalfa uh, kind of has a memory in it, and, it, and, it's, and it's, it's like us. It, the more it gets run down, the less it can fight off any any. You know, uh, invasion, whether it's uh, uh, nematodes or, or potato leaf hoppers or, or diseases. So if you stress, stress the heck out of it, so if it's under an old crop and it's stressed for nutrients and, and light and water, and you put hoppers on it, you don't cut it for you know eight, ten weeks, it's probably not going to withstand that. It's probably going to you know you're probably going to stress it a little bit. If you don't get if you don't get moisture for six weeks. Uh, it's not going to. It's not going to be growing fast enough to, to be able to fend off the potato leaf hoppers. So if you stress the heck out of it, like he said, on normal conditions, uh, yeah, you probably will have to spray it. Uh, you know, to make sure you keep it going. Those are, are, are unusual circumstances, but you do have to be aware of that. He said, just be careful. Never say never. Any other questions on potato leaf Over hoppers? Here. I was just kind of tell us about forty percent of the plots are space planted nurseries, which um, Charlie would talk about up on that. First stop, or is that where you guys started at? And so you guys started that. So that's about 40% of the of the plots, and the other 20% are either in millet or oats in a rotation um, as we get out of alfalfa for a couple of years. Um, and these of the four yield trials, we got two types of trials. We got these demo plots for about half to two thirds of the entries are commercial varieties. The other entries are elite experimentals that we think through the life of this trial will become become a commercial variety. And then the trial behind you is an experimental trial where 90% of the entries are experimentals against um, five or six commercial checks. The commercial checks are typically the um, newest varieties that the major breeding companies have on the market. So we make sure that our newer experimentals that we um, try to commercialize, um, they're getting a yield advantage based on the, the newest varieties on the market. Um, so in these four yield trials, the plots are three feet wide by 16 feet long. We've got a flail chopper mower that comes through and harvests them, throws a forge through the chopper into a into a bag. We've got uh, you know we got our summer um, temp workers that um, once to stand behind the machine, they take the bag, and we've got a scale and we weigh each bag of each plot individually. Um, this trial is three ranges. One behind you is four ranges. So um, each entry is in each range. So the rent. The entries in this trial are randomly replicated across the trial three times. So we take the average of the three weights of that entry and then compare it to uh, three or four designated um, <clears throat> varieties in here as checks. And in that trial over there, um, we'll compare all the experimentals yield to the um, commercial varieties that are in there. Um, well, also, this was seeded in the spring of 2013, so last year. Um, so this is the first production year, so we'll take quality on all these entries, first and second cut this year. So we've got all that quality data to, again, it's compared to the, the commercial checks in here. Um, Wayne, who is our farm manager, takes soil samples across the farm. So we fertilize based on those um, soil sample results. Um, we tend to fertilize a little bit on the high side. We want to make sure if we're seeing yield differences, yield advantages, their genetic differences are not um, because of the fertility of the soil. Um, and with all these little plots around here too, um, we just spray for leaf hoppers after first, second, third cut. If we scouted every little plot, we'd get behind on something, we'd miss something. And we, again, we want to make sure if we're seeing yield advantage in some of these plots, it's because of the genetic uh, potential of the variety or experimental, not because of, because of the pests. Um, so these demos are seated at all of our breeding stations. Um, and then, as Dave talked about, we have satellite locations that um, the plot behind you has all of our experimentals from every generation. So every year we put new experimental trials out at our station here, and then we um, seed in um, north and central Wisconsin and seed in Minnesota. Our Iowa station, they test in Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas. We've got a station in Pennsylvania that tests in Pennsylvania, New York. We want to um, find varieties, experimentals that um, do well across.
photographs a wide geographical area, not something that just does well here in West Salem. If we sell it, we want to be able to sell it throughout the Midwest. Does everybody know or has everybody seen where these trial results? This is the first. How are they benefit? And we talked about uh, the five dormancies on their side, the advantage. It's the threes, fours, and fives. This progression of fall dormancy uh, gives us more yield potential as we move from a three to four to a five. And so as time goes on, these fives are one of the reasons that we haven't used fives in the past is because they probably didn't have quite the level of winter hardiness that we needed for the upper Midwest. And now through plant breeding here at uh, FGI, uh, we've got some fives that are very persistent. And the thing that's interesting about this plot is this, uh, this plot has been through some really challenging, tough winters and you can see how the gunner product is holding up there. So we're very confident that fives are adapted to Wisconsin and they can tolerate our winters and we can uh, we can use these things. We had a lot of winter kill up here two years ago. Yeah, it's a lot of bad. It. Look at that gunner. Randy, what's this one next to it? That looks pretty good too. Uh, these are experimentals, oh, so uh, I don't know, Dave, I mean, Dave would be able to see what it is, but it's an experimental. <laughs> oh, is that? Oh, you it. Okay. Spoken like a true farmer. That's actually our crop land product, I do.